couldn't have gone better if I'd written it myself. Um, hello, everyone. Morning. And uh, two incredibly daunting things about this uh, presentation, one of which is going after Mike Edson. What a god. Um, so I, I will in no way be anything like as inspirational or inspiring. I might get rid of this thing because it's a bit you know, freaky. Uh, but also being in a room full of people who know way more about this than I do. So um, please feel free to heckle, disagree, and hopefully we can rewrite the presentation by the end. I'm Nick Hall, I work for an organisation called Collections Trust, uh, and we've been working on this digital benchmark that I'm going to spend the next kind of 15, 20 minutes just talking to you about. That's me on Twitter, um, that's where you can find the tools that I'm going to be talking about uh, today, and um, this uh, presentation isn't yet up on SlideShare, but it's kind of uploading. I also discovered, thinking about scale, that my uh, laptop battery didn't scale uh, to get the whole presentation written, so it may well crap out about halfway through. Uh, at which point you'll just have to bear with me uh, a little bit. Uh, I also wanted to mention this because Deloitte will charge you £10,000, probably, says the legal advisor, for this presentation. Deloitte does this amazing thing where they come into museums uh, and they charge museums between five and £10,000 for a digital consultancy uh, to help them work out where they are. So I'm going to give all of that away uh, so you can undermine Deloitte's business model disruption. <laughs> Yeah. I know, that, that's my most exciting part of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Over and done with. So, why have we been doing this? Well, this is about a journey, and I've been working with museums and libraries and archives and technology for kind of 10 years now, and it's very much about a process. And I was involved in some of the earlier, shall we say, less successful engagement between the Wikipedia community and the GLAM uh, community, and have enjoyed working with uh, the GLAM wiki community as that situation has kind of evolved. But what we've learned along the way is that each organization moves at its own pace. There is no such thing as the sector. Every organization is making its own way through this digital transition and is reaching the point of engagement uh, at different speeds and in, in kind of different ways. So we work a lot with people to celebrate successes, to look at the small wins before you start thinking about the great big visions. Uh, to look at what you can achieve before you start looking at what you can't uh, achieve. Uh, benchmarking to identify weaknesses. I was involved in around £270 million worth of government funding for digitisation between 1999 and about 2003. Some of it worked, some of it didn't work, and in many places the reason why it didn't work is that the organisations hadn't reached that point in their journey uh, where they were really in a position to spend the money in a way that was long-term and sustainable and had the maximum impact. Uh, we benchmark to advocate for funding. There's a huge evidence gap, uh, particularly around digitization and cultural heritage, uh, between the we do it because we want to do it, we do it because we've got some really cool stuff and we know everybody will love it, and the need for evidence around impact, value, reach, longevity, uh, utility. And I spent the last three days in Luxembourg with the European Commission hearing about how the Commission doesn't believe in publicly funded digitization anymore. Uh, and so this is not uh, a situation in which there is enough evidence uh, around the value of what we're doing. We need to bring people with us. The digital community tends to alienate the collections and the other communities in cultural heritage institutions. And so we need to look out and beyond uh, the digital uh, to try and bring the whole organization together around the idea of that very bold vision that Mike had uh, of the way our organizations can be and can scale uh, and can be real. So that's why. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, on benchmarking. I thought I had a lovely little quote uh, from Lewis Carroll for this one. Would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? This is kind of characterizing digital strategy in some actual <laughs> none of the organizations. That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, says the cat. I don't much care where. <laughs> then it doesn't matter which way you go. So long as I get somewhere, Alice says as an explanation. That's pretty much where most national museum directors are at right now. Um, it's either so long as I get somewhere or so long as I make some money uh, along the way. Oh, you're sure to do that, says the cat, if only you walk. Long uh, and so that uh, kind of characterizes where we've, we've been. We did some really interesting research, I really encourage you to go and have a look at it, around attitudes and values and perceptions towards technology in museums uh, particularly. And what we found were these incredibly creative, incredibly digitally literate people who are using tech at home all the time and who are socially engaged at home all the time. And then something weird and really terrible happens as soon as they walk through the door uh, of their institution, whereby they're disempowered fundamentally by not just the qualities, not that's just the money and the, the kit question, although those are issues, but by the attitude of the organization towards technology. 
And so a big part of the mission for the Collections Trust, certainly, is to try and work with people to get to that place where you don't have a physical uh, cultural institution and a digital offer. You have a cultural institution that is relevant, and in being relevant, it is at the same time both physical and digital and intellectual and social. Uh, and so we're moving towards that culture that is hybrid and the same. Uh, but we still need to get past this kind of digital hump uh, on the way to get there. There are some really kind of interesting and slightly disturbing findings in, in a number of ways. Uh, you know, stuff <coughs> people were using at home, tremendous uh, access to technology, the whole movement away from, you know, fixed point desktop tower towards uh, smartphone tablets. I love that absolutely everybody has got some sort of generic uh, uh, MP3 player. And so we're talking about people who use technology all the time in their lives, and we're also talking about incredibly positive values around technology within uh, their work. You know, the perceptions of people about what it would mean to them to be technically empowered within their, their museum. People felt that technology can help them reach new audiences. It's kind of, well, duh. But the fact that we're even having to ask the question <coughs> is a part of the problem. Uh, it's like new forms of funding and income for my museum, not so sure uh, around that one. It can help me manage the collection and enables me to communicate uh, with my museum's audiences. I'd love to meet the people that strongly disagreed with that sentiment. <laughs> I really would. I just want to work out who those people are. Uh, but actually, and one of the people who, who said that also said that they think the whole of social media is just a form of vanity publishing, which I love. I just love damning what was Mike's kind of six billion people, three billion people in the planet as kind of egocentric press <laughs> um, What we got as well was some really interesting feedback just in, in terms of the, uh, the, the words people were using. And so people were saying they don't have a digital strategy or they don't have a strategy which incorporates digital and, and social thinking. Uh, but it wasn't part of the job, you know, that, that actually it's quite easy to go through an entire career without ever having a job description in a museum that mentions technology. Um, there's this guy. It's always that person, isn't it, uh, or, the, or that woman who uh, is the person who knows about technology and everything kind of resolves back down to them. And I do think, thinking about this question of scale, uh, that there is a difference. We've got a two-tier community here. We've got the digitally empowered, and yes, they do tend to be larger uh, organizations, and then we've got a very long tail of very different organizations that are in a very different uh, place. There's this issue around uh, measurement and impact. I couldn't be at the Glam Wiki conference without talking about copyright uh, and also uh, the interwoven aspect of the museum work. But I think we can all look ahead to the future of what it will look like when technology and social engagement are the day job, but that is still some way off, and the speed at which we get to that will vary uh, differently for different institutions. So digital needs to become core business, and we're not quite in that place yet, and it kind of frustrates me because I've been doing this for 10 years now. You know, many of you in the room have been doing this, doing this for longer than that. And we sometimes despair uh, of it, but I do think there are, in all of the things Mike was talking about, and all of the things you can see in your work, you can clearly discern the progress, you can feel uh, the momentum and the movement that's happened over the last uh, 10 years. So what we've been doing is developing a, a self assessment, a diagnostic tool that allows an organization to come together without any technical knowledge. Uh, so it's an Excel uh, spreadsheet. You can also do it on a piece of paper with crayons, literally with crayons, um, uh, which has uh, eight areas uh, that we're asking people to look at and asking people to talk about in their organization. So we talk about strategy, we talk about people and skills and attitudes, we talk about the systems in the institution, both in terms of IT systems, but also systems, moving information around the organization. We love people to look at where they are in terms of digitizing their collections, and I've got some data, which I find vaguely terrifying uh, on that in a minute. Um, what people are doing in terms of then delivering content, experiences, value uh, through channels, uh, what they're using in terms of analytics, building the fantastic work Culture 24 did, uh, for their let's, let's Go Real work, how they're engaging with the public, and then, yes, um, revenue. We recently pitched, successfully, I'm glad to say, a, a piece of work for the National Museums here in the UK uh, to spend a year working with them to uh, research baseline and then make recommendations around the balance between open access uh, to their content and commercial reuse of their content. And I went into the big, scary room director suite of the Science Museum, 30 National Museum directors, a big table, 
all very scary. And they said, well, that's fascinating. What a great piece of research. We'd love to go ahead with that. We just want to drop the open access bit. If you could just focus <laughs> on telling us how to make money from our collections. Um, and so we're going to work with them to kind of come back, I hope, uh, in the other direction. So we then work with people around those areas using a series of range statements, because range statements are cool. And if you have any doubt that range statements are cool, you only have to look at the BBC class calculator. I really hope you've all used <laughs> this excellent tool. Range statements can change the whole social structure in the space of a, a week. Did anybody do this and come out as elite, by the way? What's a range statement? Yeah. A range statement is um, it's a series of incremental statements <coughs> that chart progress uh, through uh, a learning process. So it might be getting better at something, or it might be building on strategy. I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of the ones in a, in a minute. I love being heckled by Mike Edson. Hello, Mike. That was genius. Your presentation was extraordinary. Um, but yeah, so what we then start doing around those areas is, is we look at kind of where you're at. And so uh, we look at organizations where there is no plan at all and no strategy at all. And there's still a remarkable number of museums in the UK that have no strategy, whether it's a digital one or not, have no plan uh, at all. Um, and we did a session, in fact, working through this. And, and you know, about four or five people put their hands up and said, what do you do if you don't have a plan? I was kind of thinking when you leave this session and go somewhere else and write a fucking plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you move up through, yeah, okay, there's a strategic plan for the organization that has nothing to say about technology. And then you move through, um, you know, there is a plan, there's a digital project in that plan, but there's no kind of integration, there's no review process, there's no learning coming out of that strategic development. Uh, and then you say, well, there is a plan and it integrates digital in a very intuitive way and then you review it regularly. Um, there's a plan which then not only integrates digital, but makes it core, makes it part of the mission, makes it part of the identity and function and success model uh, of the museum. And then there's this fantastical Shangri-La, and we haven't quite found anyone yet who's sort of absolutely in this place, although well, I'm sure all of you are, which is that there is a mission, the digital elements of the plan are owned, championed, driven, that there are appropriate budgets attached, the digital technologies are embedded across teams and departments, that engagement and the value of engagement is part of performance, is part of success, uh, is part of measurement, uh, and that that strategic plan is regularly reviewed uh, and indeed updated. So we, we work through a number of these areas. This one is um, no content sharing, right up to uh, media making free, being made freely available for commercial and non-commercial reuse via an open channel like an unfeed or an open or a well-documented API. So we put all of these range statements out, there's 40 of them, eight uh, uh, range statements in, sorry, eight areas, five statements, and we put them out to consultation in the sector, and we got a ton of feedback back, which we've kind of integrated uh, into these. And so it's, it's quite a political assertion. What we're ultimately saying is that the, the success model, the, the, the kind of five in all areas for a museum, constitutes something which is, in its identity, in its purpose, in its behavior, in its values, uh, in what it thinks success looks like, very similar to the transformed organization that Mike was looking to uh, in his uh, talk. So that, if we're positing that as success, this is about celebrating the progress towards it. It's not about beating people over the head about where they are or aren't uh, in this progression. It's about saying, figure out where you are today, build your own picture of what great looks like, and then monitor as you make your way through uh, that process. So what we then do is we plug these into a tool, it's a very simple tool, it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's on our, our website. And you start getting just little visualizations. So we've done a number of worked examples, I'm not going to name uh, the museums uh, involved, uh, but this was a, a fairly small museum, which we think was fairly typical of the type. Huge investment in documentation systems, in procedures, in processing information around the organization, uh, really starting to open up content on their website, but also through uh, other channels. Uh, no digitization effort really going in because uh, there wasn't any more money, um, but there was almost no performance metric going on at all. There was no evaluation of the success or impact uh, of that work. But there was digital engagement work going on through um, kind of community outreach that the museum had already been doing, um, that there was no money being generated and that the strategy was kind of there, but sort of limping. Uh, along. And one of the, the things that we started learning from kind of working with organizations on implementing 
of that model is it starts to give you an idea of why some things succeed and some things fail. So if you've got documentation and knowledge systems in your organization that aren't keyed into your strategy or your model of success, then they will just sit there for 10 years being cataloged in. They won't form part uh, of the success of the organization. And so this is as much about not having silos as it is about providing a visualization uh, of the progression. So again, working with another um, museum who had found that they were doing uh, a huge amount. They'd had uh, sort of grant and aid funding to update their systems. They had very skilled people <coughs> in place. They were digitizing as part of kind of core uh, business. They were then opening up the content. Uh, this is a very large institution. Uh, and they were doing some quite sophisticated analytics. They weren't then so bothered about reaching out to audiences and engaging them. They had yet to find any way of making money uh, from their digital content, which speaks volumes. But interestingly, there was almost no strategy at all. So they've been doing this for like 10 or 20 years, and there wasn't really any engagement between the digital identity of the museum uh, and the core planning of the museum, because the core planning was done by the directorate, and the digital stuff was done by the digital uh, team. So then we started talking to people about going back over time, and we started kind of mapping the progression of these things. And we started looking at the impact of particular activities, so programs to undertake retrospective uh, cataloging programs to develop a strategy that's engaged and, and embedded digital. And this is a nothing. It's a very simple thing. It's a toy, really. But it's a toy that provides you with a, just a very simple way of looking at your organization that enables you to communicate with people who don't get it. And so it is an oversimplification. It is imperfect. It's not quite my perfect chart. My ideal chart very, very much looks like that. That's my favorite <laughs> chart of all time. The proportion of this chart does and does not present any <laughs> So what do we know so far in terms of the data? And I suspect this may be the slide where my, my kind of PowerPoint prepped out. Yeah, it was. Um, we did some work for the European Commission looking at how much stuff there is in Europe. They wanted to ask the question, how much would it cost to digitize everything in European museums, libraries, and archives? It's brilliant. I still remember the day we took that call and said, yes, we can do that. <laughs> um, 14 months and many, many lies later, um, we ended up with some numbers. But the numbers were, were the best knowledge that we could pull together from, from different places. And we're looking at you know, 265 million man-made specimen, we're looking at man-made objects, 221 million natural objects, 77 million book titles equating to 1.92 billion pages of text, many, many tens of thousands of linear meters and hours of AV uh, recordings. So we're looking at a huge body of uh, material for <coughs> digitization. We found uh, in all of the research, so we, we completed a research program uh, October last year, and published the results in, in, in February this year, um, across 2,000 institutions across Europe. Uh, we found that photos are far and away the most commonly digitized format. Uh, we found that 83% of cultural heritage organizations have a digital collection that they're actively growing, which combines digitization activities and, and born digital. Uh, we found, and this varies wildly across different types of institutions, different communities, different media, um, but the median, the kind of average is that 20% 20, 20 of collections across Europe have been digitized since uh, 1999. Uh, and that there is around 57% that we would like to be. Now, it's an absurd oversimplification. If you look at the, the variables, you see that you know, somewhere like a national library might be quoting between 4 and 7% of its collections have been digitized, whereas a major art museum quotes between 50 and 55%. <coughs> We're looking at a huge active collecting area around Born Digital. Uh, we're looking at this real disparity, though, between organizations that are digitizing, are growing digital collections for which digital is a big part of their identity, um, against the 34% uh, that have a digitization strategy. One of the things that we saw from all of the data that came back in is that public sector investment in digitization across the whole of Europe has collapsed. It's just gone. Um, whereas uh, what's actually happening, though, is that the net investment in digitization has only gone down slightly because organizations themselves are paying for the digitization from internal budgets. And that's a real story about internalizing the business of digitizing, of converting from atoms to electrons. Um, and you wonder about the opportunity cost of all of the digital mission, the earth or the public health, that we're not delivering uh, with that. We then found 24% of those 2,000 had a, original, a written digital preservation strategy. Now, far fewer still were actually doing it. Um, so we found relatively few with one, and very few who were actively digitized, uh, <coughs> digitally preserving 
uh, the content they were generating. We found 85% of those people who came back to us uh, monitoring uh, the, the use of their digital collections. And we found this slightly terrifying figure, which is that on average, across institutions of scale, from very small but very, very big, uh, you're looking at around 3.3% of FTE staff working on the digital. Uh, so if you compare that to average public engagement collections, the other functions of the institution, this remains a marginal activity. And so we're thinking about Mike's question of scale. If we're thinking about those millions of eligible things that need to be converted if they're to have relevance and power and traction. Uh, and then you think about the last 10 years, the many tens of millions of pounds have gone into this business uh, and what we've been able to achieve, which bits of that whale we've been able to take chunks out of. Uh, it remains a huge scaling task. Uh, and so I think there's some fascinating questions about what's realistically achievable uh, in this world. So I think I would argue, and from all of the work that I've been kind of involved in with, with the Wikipedia community as well, is that when don't spring fully formed into publishing linked token data, even where you've got incredibly committed, very technically aware and um, open people working in the institution, the governance structure, the management, the leadership, <coughs> the model of success is not yet there to value that as the, the kind of outcome. And I think sometimes there's a real frustration between the moral imperative towards openness that I feel kind of in, in the Wikipedia uh, world and the need to get the cultural community there. A lot of my work is based around something called the Cultural Commons uh, for Europe and is founded in the idea that culture is a commons. When we accept material into the cultural domain, we are accepting it on behalf of uh, a commons and we are accepting a shared entitlement and shared responsibility for it. Uh, I say that to rooms full of cultural heritage people, and you can almost feel them glazing over and wishing that I would go on to the next slide, which is indeed my last, which is to say that it takes time and needs to be nurtured and it needs to be celebrated along the way. So we think that the success model at the other end of that benchmarking process is that open, that, that engaged, that tremendously creative and imaginative organization. But each step, each point on that star chart, each kind of moment of development is something that we need to be celebrated. And I think there's too much tendency to criticize people for not being at that end uh, of the picture and for not getting there fast enough. And I think the, the way to get this working is to celebrate the steps that people are taking uh, along the way in every single uh, organization. <coughs> So that's everything I had to say. It's all uh, up and online there. We welcome comments, criticisms. We're going to be rolling out the benchmarking model uh, more widely across the UK. Uh, but we're also in discussion about building it into the museum accreditation scheme uh, because the idea is that ultimately what gets measured in cultural heritage gets managed, gets done. Uh, and so we want to bring accreditation fully into what the sector does to develop itself. So thank you very much for your attention.